Grab your Bibles and follow along. Matthew chapter 7. I preached this same message here, I want to say, seven years ago, if I'm not mistaken. As I looked at the dates, I tried to keep a date and time, morning and evening service of each message I preached. So the last one I have record of preaching is here. I don't like to repeat messages. I really don't. I feel like, even if I try, I feel like what, even if I preach the same message, it just applies differently. So I don't like generally doing that. But as I've been praying this morning and looking at this, I believe this is the direction to go. So Matthew chapter 7, I guess it'd be better if I turn my Bible. I was looking down on my notes to read this Bible and it's not there. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to begin reading in verse number 24. Follow along as I read. The Bible says this. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them will be like unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, and the house uh, flood, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Father, this morning as we do something very different in what I believe in your will this morning, I pray that you would give me the words to say. I pray, Father, that you would help each and every one of us to listen. Help us, Lord, to hear what you want us to hear. Lord, our desire is to find encouragement from you. Our desire is to find strength in you this morning. And I pray that you would use me and whatever words you give me for these next few moments to speak to our hearts. Father, may we listen. Would you fill me with your spirit? Fill this room with your spirit. For all those listening uh, uh, online, all those here in person, Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would do something that I cannot. And we look forward to that. It is in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. The title of the message this morning is The Storm You Are In Will Not Destroy You. You ever been in a really bad storm? Just a few weeks ago, we had this fear of a snowstorm coming our way. Uh, they mentioned something about one this week too. Last, was it last Sunday or something like that? Uh, we went to eat and they're like, we're getting ready for the storm tonight. And I'm like, yeah, you know, the rain coming in. Y- you know, storms are something when a little bit of rain in the Northeast gets a name to it. They're naming them now. I mean, we barely got anything. But uh, a few, that few weeks ago, if you remember, we're waiting for this big storm and nothing hit us, barely. And then we hear about this lockdown on 95 right outside Fredericksburg, Virginia. I have a pastor friend down there, and he posted on, on, his, uh, on his social media that they, the, the church had never been out of, out of power. They're out of power almost the entire week. And uh, so I'm, I'm watching the news as they're talking. One guy said he got out of his car, walked into a hotel, hopefully just to lay, sleep in one of the hallways, and it was already jam-packed full of people sleeping in hallways. I'm like, man, can you imagine being stranded in a place like that? Maybe minimal... Um, uh, power. Maybe you're stuck in your car. Uh, year, uh, while, years ago, shortly after I moved here as youth pastor, I remember all the details, but up northern Pennsylvania, one of the highways up there uh, locked down due to snow. And from what I understand, if I understand the story correctly, people tried to leave their cars and the police told them not to. Because if for some reason they were able to clear the road, they didn't want cars stranded. So you would have gotten ticketed if you left your car while you knew you'd be there all night long. And so and the, other, the reason I know this story, apparently there was a Chick-fil-A in town heard about that, and they started using snowmobiles and taking food out to the different people out there, all right? And I'm like, free food? It was they, good for them. I did not want free food that day. But I've heard stories about those kind of storms. And you can talk about storms where they've ripped off roofs. It wasn't that long ago. Tornadoes in, Midwestern part, in the Midwestern part of our country. In fact, I heard of one of those tornadoes that hit ground in this storm, it, I, I, you hear this a little bit, but it hit ground, and I, if I remember, was it two miles or 200 miles it went on ground? I'm sorry? It did go. It hit ground and stayed on ground for 200 miles. That is just unheard of. And the amount of damage wasn't that long ago. We had a tornado here that we just hadn't heard of before. 
And I'm driving over here and I'm like, I'm, I'm literally driving to the church to see if the basement's flooded and I'm seeing helicopters. I'm like, what's going on? You know, and the helicopters are looking at Faulkner Toyota that had been completely destroyed. And I'm like, I wonder if something going on. You ever think, I think I missed something? That's what it was that day. But why is it when we think of the Bible and the Bible referring many times to storms, why does God use storms in Scripture as a comparison for us in our daily lives, the battles we face. Uh, And what I look at is simply this. Storms are uncertain. They're uncontrollable. And in many times, leave disasters. We don't know when they're coming, if they're coming. We don't know how to prepare for them. And no matter how well you prepare for them, it could still cause damage. In our basement down here below us, we have so many times worked on different spots to stop floods. I remember there used to be a door going out the back corner up underneath what's now the prophet's chamber. And so we had the door removed and concreted it all the way up. We're like, we have solved our flooding problem. That next Christmas Eve, four inches all the way through the basement. And it came from, we have pumps out by in front of the gym that died and water just came in through the wall. And I'm like, Lord, why can't you just give us a new building? This is really getting a little frustrating. It just, you never know. And you don't know the extent of damage. And that's why when we look sometimes at the battles we face or the things that God allows into our life, the best way to describe them are storms. This storm could be a battle in your marriage. It could be a battle in your home. It could be things at school. It could be frustrations of finances. It could be work-related. It could be things that no one else knows about you. And it's just in your mind. And you're battling between you and God. And you just can't figure it out. And Satan is using all of these things to discourage you. It could be information you got this week or last week. That just say, Lord, and maybe you've been there. I've been there. Ask you, you, you stop, and, you, and you're not, you don't even get spiritual enough to get on your knees. You just stop in the middle of the room, and you say, what are you doing? I don't know if you've been there, but I know I have. When we look at all of this, I want us to look at one principle, and I believe we're going to look at three different sections of Scripture. Based upon three sections of Scripture, I think we can prove through three ways this one truth. The storm you are in, you are in will not destroy you. So three reasons why the storm will not destroy you. Reason number one, you are built on a solid foundation. Matthew chapter 7, we won't read the section of scripture again, but Jesus is teaching and he begins to teach. Many of us know, we, we probably sang the song, if you grew up in church, the wise man built his house upon the rock, the foolish man built his house upon the sand, the rains came tumbling down, and if you were in children's church, you did all of this up and down and plat. but the truth is there, that the foundation that you build will establish your life. Now, obviously, he's talking about a house, but he's using the house as an example of our life. The first thought is, if you have built your life upon the principles of God and his word, the storm cannot destroy you. If your principle, if your life is built on the word of God, and you're following the word of God, storms are going to come, but they won't destroy you, because your foundation is strong. But if your foundation is not built, if it's built on yourself and your morals or, or this world or this government or your economy or your, you know, your retirement, if that's what your foundation's built on, storms are going to have a massive effect in your life because everything you hold dear to could crumble immediately. I live in the Plumridge section of Levittown right across the corner from Giant Grocery Store, and we have one spot in front of our house. It is intriguing what happens. I heard about that when I moved in. I didn't hear about it until after I moved in. I moved in, and my neighbor Max comes over. He goes, I'm Max, if you need any help, and he's a great guy. He goes, by the way, if it rains, it may flood your front yard. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I live in Levittown. It's not going to flood our front yard. He goes, don't worry. He goes, listen, just, we just wanted to warn you. He goes, we've been fighting the township for, wow, well, what do you say, 30 years or whatever, and they just won't fix the drainage system. And I'm like, yeah. And I did. I walked in the house. That dude's exaggerating. He's exaggerating. And I, I'm telling you, it doesn't just flood. I've debated to buy a boat just for the fun of it. I'm, we joked about it the other day. It can get a couple feet deep. And my kids are like, wouldn't it be great? We just, just for the picture for Bristol Township of us in a boat going up and down. We could float on it. 
A fr- neighbor friend of mine was driving, his wife was driving down the street. She was convinced the water, she was, I could see the sidewalks. You couldn't see the sidewalks. The wa- she was, but I really thought it was only a couple inches deep. As she comes in, her boy in the back was getting excited because the car was turning into a swimming pool. Literally water pouring in. And he's like, this is awesome. Mom's freaking out. So what does she do? She does what any good mom would do. She hits the gas pedal. Anybody else knows what just happened? Blew the engine. Pulled it in the exhaust manifold, cracked the engine. My neighbor comes out, shoves it out of the way. I'm sitting there. We're looking. My neighbor is a mechanic, and he's looking at this car as the husband's standing there. And he's, he's like, we can see oil dripping from the bottom. And he's just trying to find a way to be optimistic. And he finally goes, I'm sorry, man. It's gone. And the neighbor's sitting there. He's got a smile on his face. He's like, bummer, we just paid it off. (laughs) I'm just like, man. You know, we look at that. Now, here's the thing that grabs my attention more is I watch the water. There have been times, my neighbors told me times, where it gets into their their houses. Now, you look and think, I'd be a little frustrated. I I would be a little frustrated with the township. Can you look? Storms can have all kinds of unpredictable damage. And and unpredictable, when it comes in, you don't know what's going to happen. Now, fortunately, there's not been massive damage in our neighborhood, but you get the point. If these homes were built weekly and the storms came in, they're going to fall down. If my life is built on my goals, my desires, my values, what I want, and not built on biblical principles, and then when things in the news happen, and things happen in my life, it's inevitably I'm going to become nervous and full of fear because my life is built on those, not on God. And what I hold dear to could collapse. The thought under the first one is, if your life is built upon the principles of God, the storm cannot destroy you. But the second thought under this is, everyone will have storms. If, you're built, if you build your house on the mountaintop or in the valley, you will have storms. The difference is some survive the storm, some are destroyed by the storm. Sometimes a storm can be one huge thing or maybe a list of little things that just don't seem to stop coming. Someone may believe that they have utterly fallen away from God in the storm. And then they ask God, what did I do now? What did I do? What can I do now? And friend, may, it may not be that you've fallen. It might just still be that you're still in the middle of the storm. And it feels overwhelming. Maybe you say, I watched someone else fall. They must not have had their foundation on Jesus. They fell in the midst of the storm. And, well, that simply could just be your perspective. As one man said, let's, more, let's be more worried about ourselves. We look at this. Everyone has storms. And sometimes we can become judgmental or struggle. Here's the thing. Your storm doesn't make you better than someone else. Your storm doesn't make you worse than anybody else. Your storm makes you alive. Christianity doesn't eliminate storms. You're still going to be there. Number three, if you you do not build your foundation upon the Lord, the storm will make you fall. First of all, if you're not saved... If you're not truly saved, you're going to look at religion and you're going to look at all these things and you're going to wonder why God seems to be absent in life with religion. Because he is. Because religion is about me. It's about man. It's not about God. And when I have Jesus in my life, then I see him work in ways that just don't make sense otherwise. That's what I need. That's the difference. Let me encourage you today. Salvation is not about being a member of a church. It's not about being baptized. It's not about growing up in a Christian home. None of those things bring salvation. The simple, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so I ask you, have you placed your faith in Jesus? Not in church, not in baptism, not in a movement, not in the name of a church. In Jesus, have you done that? That is the core. You know what then he says in John chapter 10? He says, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave me them all is greater than, well, gave them me is greater than all. No man shall pluck them out of my Father's hand. Here's what he said. They're in my hand, Jesus, and God has put his hand around me. Here's the point. If I am truly saved, nothing can shake me from that place. But if I've never been truly saved, then it just seems to, it seems to shake and it can shatter. Now, can I encourage you? I hope you understand. I'm not trying to say, you just got to do what we want. So many religions want to say, you didn't do what we wanted, you didn't do what we wanted. That's, that's not what I'm saying today. I'm not saying your religion's wrong, you got to do exactly what our form of Baptist does. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, God has told us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is simply about you and Jesus and how much he loved you to go onto the cross for you. 
And if you, love, if you recognize that love and accept that love and you just take the word of God as it is, not religion, what the Bible says, he says, for by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. A any man should boast. It's a gift he wants to give you if you will accept it today. You see, pastor, this, this form of, of salvation doesn't seem very tolerant. Well, I'm not trying to be tolerant. I'm trying to be truthful this morning when it comes to salvation. I don't want to offend you out of, I don't want to offend you in, or not offend you into hell. This is truth, and this is how much Jesus loves you. If your base of your foundations upon your own morality, you will fail. It needs to be founded in Jesus. The storm will not destroy you, number one, if you have the right foundation. Number two, the storm you are in will not destroy you. Number two, because you have a divine protection. Take your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 4. Just a few pages over to Mark chapter 4. I'm going to be in verse number 35 here in a second. Mark chapter 4, verse number 35. The second thing we can know in this promise is because we have of a divine protection. Mark chapter 4, verse number 35, the Bible says this, And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, this is Jesus speaking, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there rose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full, full of water. Verse 38. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, or and they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Three thoughts under this aspect of divine protection. One, we have his presence in the storm. Jesus didn't just send the disciples this time by alone. He was in the storm, in the boat with them. The storm will come, it will not destroy you simply because Jesus is there and he's not concerned. He has power over whatever you're in at the moment. Number two, we have his power in the storm. He knew the storm was coming. He knows about your storm. He knew the storm could not destroy that ship and it will not destroy yours if you keep it strong in him. Can, can I encourage you in one thought of this passage? Jesus was asleep. Years ago, I read a, a thought on this. Jesus was not necessarily sleeping as much for the need of rest as it much for the need to be awakened. Jesus slept through the storm because he knew the storm could not hurt a boat that he was in. But the disciples didn't know that yet. So they woke him up. And what did they say to Jesus? And I'm telling you, each and every one of us at some point have said something like this. It, maybe. I know I have. It wake Jesus up and say, do you even realize we're in trouble? Do you even recognize my situation? Do you know what goes through my mind? Do you know the battle that I'm facing right now? Are you even aware? And what does Jesus do? We think he's going to wake up and say, I'm sorry. I know I've been busy. What does he do? He looks at us and says, where is your faith? They're like, that's not the answer I was expecting. But it's the answer I needed. We go through these, and I'm telling you, they're not easy. And he, he, we have his presence, but he was asleep. That doesn't mean he was careless. It doesn't mean he wasn't aware. That doesn't mean, in fact, more than likely, he brought the storm. He brought it in so that he could teach them that he is more powerful. And as long as he is there, things are not always going to be easy, but they will be okay. The third thought was we have a history with the Savior. When you have a history with God, you do not get discouraged by every small difficulty. It's not as easy because you've seen him work in a certain way. For some, maybe this is new. And you're saying, ah, this is scary, this is hard. And yes, it is. But I'm promising you from someone who's been through a couple that at some point you're going to see God do something and you're going to say, that's amazing. And you're going to see God work. And you're going to say, God cared about me and God did this for me. And I can't believe it. This is exciting. You don't want to go back in another storm, but you're glad God was there in the midst of that storm. I want to read a passage. One man said that this passage talks about diplomatic immunity. He says in Psalm 91, verse 1, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. 
David says this, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. And from the noisome pestilence he shall cover thee with his feathers. And under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. We don't know what you're in. But God says in the midst of all of that, even he uses the picture of a bird covering his little, her little ones with feathers. It's not always going to be easy. He's not saying, come to me and I will eliminate the problem. He says, come to me and I will just give you a little bit of shade, a little bit of rest, a little bit of respite in the midst of this time. Let's look at number three. The storm will not destroy you because the storm is actually meant to strengthen you. Take your Bible to Psalm chapter 92. Back to the Old Testament. Psalm chapter 92. Psalm chapter 92, we'll begin in verse number 12 here in just a moment. The Bible won't stay in Psalm 92. Psalm chapter 92. The third thing is the reason the storm will not destroy you is the storm is actually meant to strengthen you. Psalm 92, verse number 12, the Bible says this, The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. The first thing we see is a couple of biblical illustrations that Jesus puts into this passage. He talks in verse 12, you should be like a palm tree. You should grow like cedar in Lebanon. I'll tell you, the very first time I saw a palm tree, we went down actually in high school on a college trip to Pensacola. I wasn't impressed. I just, you know, okay, whatever. I mean, I'm from the north. It's a palm tree. <laughs> and then one time, I remember we were in Disney a couple years ago. And I were, it storms are coming through. Granted, I've not been in Florida that much. Storm, I, mean, the, I mean, it was dark. Everything in Disney, Disney had canceled. All of the lights we were waiting for. And they're all over the speakers. Please go home. If it wasn't that way, but kind of close. Please get out. This is not good. And I'm like, I'm just really intrigued what's going to happen. And, but... As we're driving, we're going home in the buses. The Disney buses are going back. You see the palm trees and the storms coming in. I was amazed at this palm tree as it would swing. I mean, almost, it was hitting the ground. And I'm waiting for it to snap. I'm from the north. Our trees don't do that. And I'm, I'm waiting for this thing to break. And it just comes right back up. And then right back down. And right back up. And the next day, we're going back in. And I'm waiting to see all these palm trees on the ground. And guess what I saw? Them standing nice and straight. And I'm like, okay, all right, a little some respect here for the palm trees. And you don't think a lot about it until here's what God says, that's what you'll be like. The storm's going to bend you a little bit. The storm's going to make you a little uncomfortable. The storm's going to bend you out of shape sometimes. But when it's all done, you'll still remain standing. That is what God says happens. When, who did he call it? I'm going to go back to the passage I found. The righteous is what he says with floors like that. And he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. Can I encourage you the idea of planted in the house of the Lord? You say, well, you're just going to talk more about church attendance. Well, that's part of it. Here's something that I hope we understand. This a little bit goes back to what we said, but I want to add a little more to it than I did the first time. We talk about the Bible being the premise. For over years, I've had people, um, sometimes... Just unsaved people, why would God allow this? Can I encourage you in one area? This, that, that question, I understand the question from the world, why would God allow this? But I think it's intriguing that the world loves to blame God when things fall apart, but they never give God credit when things go well. It's, it, there's no logic behind that. If God is, good, is powerful enough to make bad things go happen, how come he's not powerful enough for me to follow? And my favorite is when the atheists say, see what your God did. I said, I thought you didn't believe in him. Now, God does not intervene on life of people who are not part of his family. That's not trying to be mean. That's to be rude. For those who have not placed their faith in Jesus, he has no obligation to intervene for them. And the world, the Bible says, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. So where do you think the problems are coming from? Between him and our sinful nature, we can't be surprised by where we are. You see, God, why is this happening? Because he's allowed us to do what we want. 
And anytime you let people do what they want, they become dumb. Don't we? Pastor, I'm not like that. I'll just talk to your friends. Probably you are just like that like I am, all right? We all do something wrong. Silly. If, if we're given complete freedom and we think we can get away with it, we all will do something that's just foolish. So my point is this. This also then goes to Chris. So number one, if we're not saved, it's not that God doesn't care, doesn't love you. It's just that you're in a different family. Second of all, you're in his family, but we're not really walking in him. Okay, do my devotions more. That. Yeah, and again, doing my devotions more is important. And the word of God being a church is important. I believe that. I guess the best way to go back is to the section of scripture we quoted a moment ago. And I think it's in, I think it's 1 Corinthians. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. You know what God said? It's less about going through tradition. I think being in church is important. I think reading your Bible is important. I think it's core. If you're not reading your Bible and praying, you can't expect to hear from God. You just can't. That's how he teaches us. But none of that's going to happen until God is the one I seek first. If I don't want to do that first, I can read my Bible now and then. Because here's what we do. Yeah, at least I've been there. I don't, I don't touch this for months on end. My life falls apart. Then I come back and I'm convinced a couple chapters in Psalms is going to solve everything. No. God will be there to help me. And he'll even be there to help me to pick up the pieces. But my life will still go into shambles if this is not part of it. And yes, it's reading. But it's also doing. It's obedience to it. So when I know what God wants me to do, and I won't do it, then God has never promised to help. God has never said knowledge of Scripture is the answer to my problems. He has said obedience to it. Scripture is the answer to my problems. Husbands, you want a good home? Obey the word of God. Wives, you want a good home? Obey the word of God. Kids, you want your parents off your back? Obey the Bible. Obey and honor. Say, you don't know my parents. No, but I know the Bible. And I know they've promised a promise to you. Isn't it bad that one of the few commandments that comes with the promise goes to kids? Honor your parents and it shall be well with thee. All right, now I'm still a kid. I still can do that, right? Here's the point. We love to kind of do our own thing. And, and we, don't, we, don't, we don't deal with our finances the way God wants us to. We don't give. We, we don't come to church. We don't do this. We don't do that. And then in the midst of somehow all of this, we think randomly. You're, uh, not too long ago, someone came to church. They came in. They attended two services over a span of six weeks. And then complained to me that God hadn't solved their problems. What, has he become a drive through worker now? I said this to the teens the other day. This is, this, is my, this is what I believe are some people's view of God. You ever gone into McDonald's? Well, now it probably takes you three years to get to the second window. Any restaurant, okay? Uh, and you say, I don't even go to uh, drive throughs anymore. That's great. Anyway, if you go to a drive through you ask for something, you get to the window and pay for it, and they give you the wrong thing. What do you do? You complain. You start knocking on the window. This is the wrong thing, whatever. Uh, and we do that. We, we order certain drinks, and they give us the wrong ones. You ever order a Dr. Pepper, and you're given a root beer? It's just not the same thing. Or even worse, a Diet Coke. It's like they're making fun of you now, right? So we knock. This is the wrong drink. Now, we sometimes treat God like that, don't we? God, I prayed. I go to the speaker. I prayed. I know it's been the first time in a while, but I prayed. I'm at the second window. You didn't answer right. And then we have a right to get mad at God like we did the drive through worker. Sometimes exactly how we treat God. How dare God not do what I want him to do? You know what God could say? He's so gracious he doesn't. You know what he could say? How dare you ignore everything I've given you? I'm glad God doesn't do that. I would if I were God. That's why I'm not, all right? We would all be a whole lot different. We're all be different if any of us were God. God is so gracious and long-suffering and loving. He doesn't do that. But the fact still remains. While God is not angry and bitter at us over these things, the fact still remains that the simple truth is God blesses his principles. And when I follow them, I've got a foundation. When I don't, it's, I have to expect to be, my life to not be much different than the world. He gives these illustrations, but then he also gives us a condition. He says in verse 13, those that be planted in the house of the Lord. This is growth. I'm planted, then I continue to grow. I make this a point. It's not going to be easy. But being there, reading, participating, letting God teach me, this is where that foundation comes. This, this is not how, if we can hold on long enough. This is this promise as if we, that he will never let go. Let me read this again. We need to know, we need to grow where we're planted. We need to dig our roots deep in Jesus. 
But this is not if I can hold on long enough. This is the promise that God will never let me go. The song we sing, the newer one we sing, He will hold me fast. One of the reasons I brought it in is just the doctrine of truth behind it. But it's a simple principle. How many times do we feel like we have to do our best to be a good Christian? And that's not at all what it is. To buy that song, and it's a scriptural principle from Jude, He will hold me. He will hold me fast. That's the foundation I hold on to. It's not how good I can be and then God will love me. He will hold me there. That's why I stay there. If we're not careful, we can become so angry that we don't even realize that we are going, what we are going through is meant to help us become stronger. The storm we're in right now should strengthen us, should drive us to God, should drive us to our knees, should drive us to the Bible, should help us to get things right with each other and get things right with God, should help us to just purify and help us to see the truth, rebuild that foundation. But we can become so angry at our circumstance that instead of getting it right with God and others, we can walk away from it. That's what we call Satan winning. Don't let him win. Don't let him win. Taking the steps is not always easy, but it's the greatest thing you can do. The third thing is we have an amazing promise. Verse 14. They shall br still bring forth fruit in the old age. What that promise is. You're going to have a lot of problems coming, but that doesn't mean they're going to stop you or destroy you. At some point. As you get older, you're still going to be serving. You're still going to be effective. As seasons are going to change, but you're going to be helped and effective. Can I encourage you today? I, I know some, just talking to some this morning, and uh, just some of the things that we're going through. As uh, individuals, as a church, just when the Bible tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And throughout the morning, as I've just had many, many conversations, I'm telling you, my, my heart is breaking for some people in here that are just overwhelmed with things right now. And so as God laid this upon my heart, I hope it's an encouragement. I, I wish I could say that tomorrow God will eliminate the storm. I wish I could say that the storm won't get worse. But what I can say is no matter where you are in the storm, God is there, his presence is there, his power is there, and he's promised to never leave you nor forsake you. Maybe today we just give it to God and lay it down again and ask him for strength.